to Clough United Methodist Church. We are so glad you're here in worship with us this morning, where you are invited to come connect, grow, and serve your roadmap to a meaningful purpose. And to remind you that you're welcome here, no matter where you have come from and no matter where you're going, no matter what you believe or doubt, no matter what you have or don't have, and no matter whom you love, all of you is welcomed into this time of worship by God who loves you, knows you by name, and wants a personal relationship with you. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. 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 So, um, I, I got a few announcements. One is that I am going on vacation, uh, and uh, yay, about two or three. Two and a half, three weeks, so I will not be here for three Sundays. And so uh, Pastor Jennifer will be preaching the first and third Sunday, and our late leader, um, Irene, will be preaching the second Sunday. So we got all that covered, all right? So when I go to vacation, I don't have to work on the last part of my vacation preparing for a sermon. <laughs> so we're gonna, it's going to be okay. And... Um, you know, I've been reappointed as your uh, as the senior pastor here, uh, even though I'm in I'm appointed in retirement relations because I am officially retired from the United Methodist Church because I've met the age requirements. But you retired pastors still are able to serve churches, and so I'm here with you for another year. So, um, <laughs> thank you. Now. Um, I don't know, my heart is really kind of heavy about this Surfside disaster and tragedy. Have y'all been saying, you know, it's like, you know, I, I want to do something, but I don't know what to do, you know, um, and, but pray, right? Prayers, but I mean, that is a tragedy, and I know that people are holding out hope, but a 12-story fell down to a three-story and they got 150 people there missing. I don't think, I think what they're going to find remains. I don't know that. But, you know, just keep them in your heart because it's, it's just, you know, they're running it on a loop on the news and it's just, it's just heartbreaking is what it is. Okay, so are there any other announcements? Okay, if not, let's prepare our hearts for much. As you hear these centering words. Loving God, let your words speak to our hearts. Come and heal our brokenness and restore us to life. Comfort our grieving hearts and teach us to share from our abundance. So I ask you to please stand as you're able to, so we can begin our worship in praise and prayer.
Loving God, we are yours. We come as we are with our cares and our concerns. We long to touch you and to find healing in your embrace. Strengthen our faith and heal our brokenness that we may worship you with joy. Amen and amen. You may be seated. The Gospel lesson this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. Jesus crossed the lake again, and on the other side a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Jairus, one of the synagogue leaders, came forward. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded with him, My daughter is about to die. Please come and place your hands on her so that she can be healed and live. So Jesus went with them. A swarm of people were following Jesus, crowding in on him. A woman was there who had been bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a lot under the care of many doctors and had spent everything she had without getting any better. In fact, she had gotten worse. Because she had heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothes. She was thinking, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Her bleeding stopped immediately, and she sensed in her body that her illness had been healed. At that very moment, Jesus recognized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, Don't you see the crowd pressing against you? Yet you ask, Who touched me? But Jesus looked around carefully to see who had done it. The woman, full of fear and trembling, came forward. Knowing what had happened to her, she fell down in front of Jesus and told him the whole truth. He responded, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace, healed from your disease. While Jesus was still speaking with her, messengers came from the synagogue leader's house, saying to Jairus, Your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher any longer? But Jesus overheard their report and said to the synagogue leader, Don't be afraid, just keep trusting. He didn't allow anyone to follow him except Peter, James, and John, James's brother. They came to the synagogue leader's house, and he saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, What's all this commotion and crying about? The child isn't dead. She's only sleeping. They laughed at him, but he threw them all out. Then taking the child's parents and his disciples with him, he went to the room where the child was. Taking her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, young woman, get up. Suddenly the young woman got up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. They were shocked. He gave them strict orders that no one should know what had happened. Then he told them to give her something to eat. The second reading this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 through 15. Be the best in this work of grace in the same way that you are the best in everything, such as faith, speech, knowledge, total commitment, and the love you inspire in me. I'm not giving an order. But by mentioning the commitment of others, I'm trying to prove the authenticity of your love also. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Although he was rich, he became poor for your sakes, so that you could become rich through his poverty. I'm giving you all my opinion about this. It's to your advantage to do this. Since you not only started to do it last year, but you wanted to do it too. Now finish the job as well, 
so that you finish it with as much enthusiasm as you started, given what you can afford. A gift is appreciated because what of what a person can afford, not because of what that person can't afford, if it's apparent that it's done willingly. It isn't that we want others to have financial ease and new financial difficulties, but it's a matter of equality. At the present moment, your surplus can fill their deficit, so that in the future, their surplus can fill your deficit. In this way, there is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered more didn't have too much, and the one who gathered less didn't have too little. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you join us in our song of response? Open the eyes of my heart.
Amen. So just let me let you know that um, there's a little a clip right now. My daughter and my grandchildren are here. And uh, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that <laughs> at all. <laughs> Ooh, okay, so the sermon is <laughs> giving, uh, giving what you have. Now, it is said that C.S. Lewis walked in on an academic discussion about the distinctiveness of Christianity. And those present were about to decide that there wasn't anything that set Christianity apart from any other world religion because they were unable to come up with anything that truly marked our faith and set it apart from the rest. So they put the question to Lewis, who was a you know a writer, and he paused only a moment. He said, "We said, he said, that's easy. It's grace, grace that makes us who we are as followers of Jesus Christ. Grace is what motivates us to respond with love and joy and hope. Grace is what equips us for living in this world and what allows us to help create a sense of community." as we seek out other recipients of God's grace. It is what we have to offer the world. Nothing of our own, but the gifts that come from grace. And as Wesleyans, we believe in pervenient grace. We believe in the grace that goes before you know God, that God is the hound of heaven looking for you and waiting for you to turn toward God. And we believe in justifying grace so that when you turn toward God, you're justified. Remember in typing the just justification of your margins, right? You're justified. And then there's sanctifying grace, which is what we have because of the Holy Spirit that helps us and guides us and uh, teaches us. And so that is the distinction uh, between Christianity and a lot of the world religions. And it's also the distinction between, you know, Methodism and some of the other Protestant religions, just saying. <laughs> well, anyway, we are, um, we are called to give what we have, to use what we have, to make space to think of others beside ourselves. And this worship moment is a call to raise our heads and look around us to see who is next to us in need of the grace that we have. In need of the grace that we've received. It's about realizing how much we have already received in grace from our Lord and the joy we have in living it out. It is about learning how to be present to the world around us as a way of being present to God. So this is what Paul says in a rather convoluted way in the text from 2 Corinthians. You know, it's Paul's stewardship campaign sermon, and it's not my stewardship campaign sermon. You don't have to worry. I'm not going to put out a make you make a pledge today. It's not about that. But anyway, um, and like all of us, he talks around it in such a way that you just might miss what he's saying. Paul is taking a collection for the church in Jerusalem. And so he went from church to church asking for mission giving. And the churches responded. So if you read the first part of chapter 8, you'll uh, know that Paul is proud of them for giving, and some of them gave even though they also had struggles, particularly the Macedonian church. They gave out of their poverty, is what he said. So now he comes to Corinth, you know, that big city, a church he has struggled with, to be fair, a church with a few problems and some dissension. But he still invites the people to give. He invites, excuse me, them to participate. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. The Corinth church, you know, remember, they were... They were in conflict about who baptized them. They were in conflict about the spiritual gifts, but they were rich in spiritual gifts. And they, it was a rich congregation because it was a mixed congregation of 
uh, you know, rich people and common people, whereas the Jerusalem church uh, was not that. The Jerusalem church were really kind of outcasts. They were Jewish Christians, and so they were some of the poorest. And so that's the dynamic here. And so um, verse 7 sounds like the classic buttering people up before asking them for something. You know, flattering them before sticking them with the bill, right? But that isn't what he does. The last two words of verse 7 are here translated as generous undertaking. He wants them to excel, to participate, to enjoy this generous undertaking. But the Greek words are charis perusio, which probably translate better or more directly as abounding grace. The invitation is not to give, but to participate in grace, God's abounding grace. And Paul implies that outside of God's redeeming grace, even the godliest people look out mainly for for uh, look out mainly or even only for our own self-interest and self-preservation. So God's dearly beloved people want to give generously because it's a virtue that God gives us. It's the kind of gift from God that God expects us to apply in thankful response to God's saving grace. And here's the thing, this is not to shame anyone here because we are a very generous church, the body of Christ here. We're very generous. It's just to remind us that this is the, if you're not doing it on your own, it's because of the grace of God that's in you. And with the grace of God that's in you, it empowers you to give without expecting thanks. Right? We don't give food and expect somebody to come up and thank us, do we? No. We're giving it because there is, there is a need. So it's just a reminder. But Paul goes on to explain that this is what Jesus did for us by emptying himself. Giving up and giving away that we might know glory. That we might know hope and salvation. We might be able to give grace away because we received it. Paul is trying to tell the Corinthians that he is doing them a favor by letting them give. He knows that they, like we, want to know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, I know that grace. And not only can you know it, you can live it. Not only can you receive it as a gift, you can activate it by giving it away, by participating in the ripples of grace that go from person to person, community to community, and bring transformation and experience of the kingdom. Who are we? What is our purpose? It's to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, right? And so that is our call, to bring grace from person to person. I'm reminded of the song, I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. That's what we do. Now he concludes the invitation by reminding us that love needs proof from time to time. Love needs action to really be love. At least the love that Christ calls us to, the love that God expresses. Now do you believe that, that love needs proof from time to time? I mean, if someone says they love you, and they don't want to spend any time with you, and they don't buy a gift for you, and they don't want to do anything for you, right? right? And they're mean-spirited, and argumentative, is that showing love? That, that, that seems contradictory, does it not? Right? So, you know, you gotta, uh, love needs some action. Alright? Just saying. Um, and it, it's, it's the least, uh, at least the love that Christ calls us to. The love that God's expressed. And the most famous verse of all reminds us, John 3.16, right? That for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Now in the gospel text from Mark, it is Jesus who is the example of grace or the example of giving what he has. Jesus seizes the moment, responds to the need, and is fully present to those who come to him even though there is an interruption in the midst of it all. Now, I, I wonder if Jesus got exasperated 
activated by the interruptions. Because I know that I do. <laughs> but it seems that time and time again, someone comes running up to change his course. I know he is ready to help and to heal to go where he's needed, but still, you know, maybe a little bit. Uh, the demands of a crowd wanting something from him must have been like barking dogs getting on his last nerve. It must have been, but you can't tell it by reading the Gospels. There seems to be an infinite supply of patience he could draw on. Okay, well maybe that one time when he seemed a bit short with someone, uh, let's see, he got short with the folks that were money changers in the temple, didn't he? Yeah, he got short with the uh, Phoenician woman that wanted a blessing for Yeah, there were times when he could get a little short, but that's another story that doesn't relate to this one. For the most part, he was raised in Christ. Um, of course, the point is, not only him, but we are as well. That's the hard part. To not see needs, people, opportunities as interruption, but as grace moments. To give and to receive. To be attentive and to be present. To be alive and real, like he was, like he is. Well, here's a question for us. Have you ever thought that you were invisible or out on the fringes of life? Have, how did that make you feel? Think about the woman in our story who somehow finds the courage to approach Jesus. Refusing to be powerless any longer, she breaks through the social, cultural, and religious barriers that have left her in isolation. Listen, she is seen as unclean by her community, right? She has an issue of blood. She is seen as unclean. She can't go to the synagogue. She can't go worship. She has to stay away from people. And here she is in the crowd, right? She's close to people, so she's making the crowd, the folks in here, you know, uh, religiously unclean. And then she touches the hem of Jesus' garment, making him unclean. Do you see? Now, the thing is, is that in her situation, if she did not obey the mores of the, you know, of the uh, community, she could be stoned to death. So if she didn't keep separate, she could be stoned to death. And this issue of blood happened for 12 years. So 12 years she's been isolated. But this time, she heard about Jesus, and she came, and she touched the hem. And she said immediately, she knew she was healed, right? And uh, reaching across the life boundaries that kept her apart, she shows an extraordinary faith. Jesus shows her kindness and calls her daughter, giving her a blessing that brings her new life. The daughter is you and me. I don't know what you've had to endure or what you've had to go through. I don't know how others have judged you or even why it has occurred, but I do know that something in each of us is yearning for healing and seeking after a blessing and, and willing to believe. And really, the desire to believe is enough. Now, I was just thinking again about the woman's, um, you know, uh, situation and how she was so uh, so isolated and and the, and the thing is is that <clears throat> the the disciples <laughs> turned to Jesus and act like Jesus is crazy. Come, what are you talking about? You're in a crowd, right? You know, everybody is jostling him. But the thing is, everybody didn't get healed by being in the crowd and jostling him, right? It was her faith. It was her faith that made a difference. So there is more here than an interruption. There is healing. There is acceptance. There is life out of death. There is hope. There are 12 years of a downward spiral leading to rock bottom. Then there are 12 years of a young life that seem to be vanishing like the morning mist. There is a daughter reclaimed from shame and suffering, and there is a daughter reclaimed from death. You see the connection? 
There is wonder and there is laughter, both before and after Jesus has come into the picture. And there is a secret. The secret. Why does Jesus tell the disciples and parents not to tell when they aren't going to help? To, you know, you know they're going to tell. Why do you undo a funeral? Someone is going to ask some questions. I mean, remember, he put all the mourning people out of the room. He said, get out of here. So there were people out there mourning, mourning and wailing. And uh, so if she comes walking out, they're going to ask questions. How did that happen? So it just seems an odd thing for Jesus to do. Surely he knew that they were going to tell. The only ones in the room were the little girl's parents and the three disciples. But maybe he wanted the story to be hers and not theirs. Maybe Jesus was setting the precedent for witness. Tell your own story, not someone else's. Can I get an amen? amen? Because you need to tell your own story. And tell it with your living rather than your words, at least at first. Now Jarvis was a leader of the synagogue, Mark tells us. That gives him some status. That, that puts a certain aura around him. Jairus is the person others go to. He is a decider, a determiner. Um, he has resources. He has position. He has power. He is used to, I'm sure, to solving his own problems. Except this one. My little daughter, he says. She's 12 years old. Almost an adult marriageable age, ready to move out and move on. But at the point of death, she becomes his little daughter again. Lay your hands on her, he asks. Bless her. Ordain her. Uh, set her apart. Heal her, he asks. Save her. The word that we translate here is sozo, sometimes translated as heal, sometimes translated as safe, as in are you saved? Save her, he asked, so that she may be made well and live. Not just made well, but to live also. He asked that Jesus bless her with the fullness of life and give her all that is in store for her, the potential, the goodness, the glory of God. Let her shine, he asked. No, he begs on his knees, face down in the dust, clinging to Jesus' ankles, begging. Now that's a follower. He hadn't been a follower before. He was part of the Sanhedrin, as far as we know, but he's a believer now because he interrupted the interruptible Jesus, and he pleaded for help. There is a fly. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to eat the fly. <laughs> Not a good look. Anyway, are you dead yet? I learned about dying to self in order that we might live in Christ, but I never thought I'd have to give up everything, right? I didn't realize that the selfish me would never be satisfied or have enough. We want to have control. And that makes it hard to trust that God is there to provide us with everything we need to live. And when everything seems to be falling apart, then we want God to come in and rescue us and restore everything to the way it should be, our way. Or we think God is dead and we have lost all hope. We don't believe there is anything or anybody who can bring us back to life and resurrect us from the shadow of death that surrounds us. But it is in those moments that the power of the gospel has the opportunity to shine. Jesus took the little girl by hand and told them to give her something to eat. Oh, what a feast is yet to come. Jesus gives himself away. But here's the thing. We can't give ourselves away. We can't do this thing alone. We need help. We need Jesus' help. Lay your hands on us. Bless us. Uh, bless all we encounter. Use your hands. Use your knees or whatever it takes to save us 
to make us well and alive. Then we can learn to give what we have received, grace upon grace. May we give ourselves away so God can use us. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. O generous God, in whose appointment our life stands, and who committed our work to us, we commit our cares to you. Awesome God, fill us to overflowing with your life-giving water as we seek to serve you and our neighbor with joy. We thank you that we are your children and that you have assured us that while we are intent upon your will, we, you will heed our wants. Life-giving God, help us celebrate this day and every day the love and the life you have given us. Fill us with that compassion for others' troubles, which comes from forgetfulness of our own, with the charity of those who know their own unworthiness, and with the glad hope of the children of eternity. We lift the tragedy of Surfside and the recovery efforts to locate those trapped in the debris. May our prayers turn to acts of grace in the ensuing weeks. And to you, the beginning and the end, Lord of the living, refuge of the dying, be thanks and praise for other. Amen? Amen. And we have a song of response.
this prayer of confession. God of grace, we come to you in search of healing. We come to you in search of peace. We come often bearing only a tiny seed of hope within, praying that it is enough. Our cries come in the deepest part of the night, and we do not always ask for help. Our hearts bleed just as surely as our bodies, and we do not always recognize the hidden pain of others, or even our own. Sometimes we struggle to find our faith at all, and forget that doubt, too, is part of belief. Give us courage enough to reach out for the hem of your cloak. Give us strength enough to speak the truth of our own struggles and to see and hear and know the struggles of others. Forgive us when we think you are only you only want us if we're perfect. Fill us with your endless supply of love so that we might try again. Amen? Amen. Now hear these words of assurance. Christ gave us his weakness that we might become strong. He gave us the wealth of his wisdom that we might know what is true. He offered his own vulnerability, making himself defenseless, that we might actually learn love. It is the faith Christ has given us that has made us well. The power of God's love that heals and redeems. There is forgiveness in God and a hope that makes us whole. Thanks be to God. Amen. So I'm going to ask you to join in the Apostles' Creed. Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of our life, and the life everlasting. Amen. So now is the time we, we will um, have communion, and I'd like to uh, in, make the invitation and know that United Methodist Communion is open, because this is the table of grace. This is the Lord's table. It's not our table. So sisters and brothers in Christ, the gospel tells us that on the first day of the week, the same day on which our Lord rose from the dead, he appeared to the disciples in the place where they were gathered and was made known to him in the breaking of bread. So come then to the joyful feast of the Lord. We have prepared the table with our offerings of our confession, our life, and our labor. So let us give thanks for this gift. Emmanuel, God with us, we praise you for the glorious gift of your body and act of presence in our midst. We are overwhelmed with gratitude and humbled by your intimate knowledge of us. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and on these gifts of bread and juice. In your holy mystery, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. So by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry with all the world. All power and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen? Amen. Now the sacrament is going to be received. We'll start at the back, center aisle, and return on this side. So come as you are so led.
stayed with us here. During her years here at Clough, um, she is uh, the one thing that I have really appreciated as a leader of the church is Paula's administrative skills. Um, and I've told her this over and over again. Very rarely are pastors given the gift of administrative skills. Um, and so this has been a real blessing to our church that she has that gift of administrative skills. Um, she's also worked out before COVID, would be out there on the soccer fields uh, every Saturday morning. She would be going to Summerside Elementary to help with the students there and connecting with a lot of the groups that meet here at Club uh, on a weekly basis. The other thing that I don't know that many of you might know of is that Paula is on the conference financial team. Um, and in fact, she was asked by the bishop to accept the chairmanship of that. So she is now the chair of the uh, West Ohio Conference Finance Team. Because of her being on that team, she has given us um, a heads up on many grants that have been available. And it is through that knowledge, basically, and the grant that we got for branding, rebranding the church, that you see that we have the new church logo, you see all of the um, upgrading of our facilities that we have had here throughout the pandemic. We were able to do that while everybody was away. So that has been a real blessing to us. Um, there was, uh, during the annual conference of West Ohio, there was a, um, that was all virtual, but there was a special service for all of the retirees. And um, Amy has got I hope geared up there. Uh, the segment of that service where um, Paula is featured, so we'd like to show that to everybody now. Paula Stewart's favorite scripture is Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. She came to Christianity as a born-again believer. This scripture spoke to her and changed her life forever. She said her mind was renewed by the power of God's Holy Spirit, and she changed from an agnostic to a disciple of Jesus Christ. Stewart said that two of the most memorable experiences in her ministry relate to baptism. She baptized a 95-year-old woman who was embarrassed to disclose that, although she had attended church her entire life, she had not been baptized. Stuart baptized the woman in front of her husband, children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Stuart also held a bedside baptism for a man who was terminally ill. Accompanied by eight people from the church, the man accepted Christ as his Savior and was baptized into the family of God. Two months later, she officiated his funeral. Her advice to new clergy is this, love God, love your people, and stay praying. And at this time, Paul, if you would like to, you can stand up. <laughs> we just have a couple of gifts that we wanted to give to you just to show our appreciation um, for what you have done in your ministry so far and what you continue to do here at Club. So uh, the one with the with a penny um, that we wanted to give you. And the other is a cross. I wanted to hold this up so everybody can kind of see this. And now, um, if you would like to come up, your family would like to come up, um, there's just a little something I think your daughter would like to say. Hi, Mom. <laughs> so, um, 
my mom didn't know we were coming, obviously. We wanted to make it a surprise. We got a message, and I would have missed it, so I'm, I'm thankful for God's providence. I don't really look at messages there, and there was this message that said, hey, you know, um, if you got cars, you can send them. The COVID, we can't do a lot of things we would normally do. And I said, well, hold that thought. I think we can get some family here. Ray may be here with us. It's possible. It's possible. He's, he's trying to work it out. So, um, and we wanted to come and we can take you out, you know, enjoy you and maybe plant something if you got something to work for or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. Um, this is my daughter, my mom's granddaughter, Mariah, and my son, Corino. And I just want to say this. I came to tell you to say, God keeps his commitments, he keeps his vows. That's something that has really been impressed upon me just as I, in my own development this year. And I see that in you. You kept your commitment. You kept your vow. You kept your vow to God. And even when it required you to leave what you were comfortable with, leave where you were, where you were needed, you know, we, she's our matriarch, and we had, I have a sister, a daughter, which you care for until my sister passed. So that is so significant to us to see that, to witness it, and to see your life. And um, I'm grateful to that. And I'm grateful that that's something that God, it's visible in God and it's visible in you. And so I'm, I'm really grateful. You kept your body, you kept your community. And though you're retired, you're still doing it. You, you, as you stated in your scripture, you know, you are conforming to his will. You want to know what his good and perfect will is for you. And so you're honoring that. And that's a blessing. There is a scripture I just want to read, and I'll just consider it my prayer for you and over you. It's in Ephesians 1, and it starts with verse 11, and it says, In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were first to be first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you, you know, also were included in Christ when we heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed. You are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our, inher our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. For this reason, and this is my prayer for you, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us to <laughs> so much. Thank you for accepting me as your um, a spiritual leader. Uh, thank you for, um, you know, the gifts and, and for your for your words. And, and one of the things why I wanted to continue, I started late, so I feel I still have more to give. I started, you know, and I just, and so um, we're appointed a year at a time, so I figured I got one more year with you, and probably um, I'll be appointed elsewhere, but this has been a great appointment. And I thank you and love you. Like I said, love your people, right? 
the key phrase out. <sighs> so let me uh, do the benediction. Christ, oh wait a minute. You singing a song? Or do you sing a song? Do you want to sing? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Christ touches you, you. God's love has restored you. The Spirit goes with you. So go in peace to share the joy of God's love. Amen? Amen. And amen. Thank you so much. Go in peace.